Mum sent us on TV. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you guys are so funny. Uh, remotely hosted. I'm definitely going to put a bullet point for this. I'm going to put a Linux Linux uh, from scratch. Uh, all right. So. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, uh, another video, yet another video from the RDBX GG community. Uh, RWX FM or whatever. I don't know. I always wanted to be a radio announcer. Can you tell? Uh, so get me Linux stat. Uh, this is not designed to give you uh, a bunch of deep knowledge about Linux or even to go into what Linux is. Uh, this video, which is probably going to be about an hour long. I hope I can get it faster than that. We'll try and see. But the whole purpose of this video is to tell you all the options uh, for getting Linux and there are a lot there are a lot these days Linux is everywhere uh, and therefore you can run it in many many different ways uh, and are definitely an amazing Christmas tree and as usual I have the hecklers in the audience my favorite uh, people who come visit video uh, uh, participate in the videos with us uh, open source project Provider framework for updating PC BIOS okay lots of great stuff uh, and I'm, I'm again to the, to the live studio audience. If I can't answer your heckles, I'm sorry. Uh, feel free to post anything appropriate to the chat if you want to join me. To you people watching me on YouTube, I would love to have you in a studio audience at some point. Sometimes I even give perks to the studio audience. It's a new car, or maybe just a script. Anyway, so what is this about? We're going to be talking about Linux, how to get it the fastest possible way. Uh, with the least amount of hassle. In order to do that, I'm gonna <laughs> Linux, Linux from scratch is the best distro for beginners. Don't listen. He's trying get wrecked. Is trying to get you wrecked right there. Uh, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go forward with this and go over all these different ways. Uh, eventually, this will be on rwx.gg, but as so many other things, I cannot uh, publish it right away. Uh, so eventually, you'll find this as a boost. Uh, this boost will be called Get Linux. That's the idea of the boost. All one word: Get Linux. Uh, so if you're going to look for it later and you want to see all the write-up and commentary and potential forum posts in the Discord and all that, uh, it'll be related to that. So just as a recap, I always do a video and uh, something to read um, that has to do with it. And generally, there's a, a community forum for it eventually, if not just in the Discord. At um, some point, I might even add an actual forum tech, a software. All right. So the, what is, again, Linux is everywhere. It's the operating system you should have, you should learn. It's the basis of, of all the stuff that I do on the terminal. This is all Linux. Uh, you can have Linux in many way, different places and ways. Uh, so the first first way to, to know that to do that is to have it on hardware already that you buy. You buy a laptop or you buy a server and you get it. Uh, the second main way to get it is to replace uh, the hardware, the operating system already on a, a computer that you have. And this is a really great way to breathe life back into uh, a computer. And we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about live booting. That is basically leaving your operating system alone that's on your computer, say your laptop, and booting from a USB or an external uh, hard drive of some kind and running Linux on that. So that doesn't even touch the stuff that's on your precious Windows gaming PC. You can actually boot off of another thing, use it temporarily, and then come back to that. And fourth, I can't make my fourth finger come up. This is my, my advanced graphics here is my fingers. Uh, so number four, uh, locally hosted. So locally hosted means putting uh, Linux as sort of an app on your computer. It's kind of a stretch to call it an app, but putting it on your computer. So it's inside your computer and you can use it there. Uh, and, and there's lots of technology to do that these days. The two big ones are virtual machines and containers. So we'll breeze past that. Uh, but then you can have remotely hosted. So uh, remotely hosted is where you use Linux on somebody else's computer. And usually that computer is in a, some, a cloud someplace. Uh, and, you know, Amazon, Pico, Azure, Google, wherever. And you're using their computer and you're putting your Linux on their computer. Uh, and you're paying them to use it usually. And so you're using Pico, which you can do for free. So anyway, um, there are lots of places over there that you can do that. Now, there's some caveats for Pico, by the way, which we'll get to. You can't use it for free unless you're using it for Pico CTF stuff. Anyway, and then the last one, which everybody remind me of, uh, Linux from scratch. So our trolls are out here telling you that that's what every beginner should do. No. So Linux from scratch, first of all, is a book. 
<laughs> it's a book about how to build your own Linux operating system system uh, by installing you know the kernel and all the individual pieces that go into Linux and making your very own, which is really cool today because guess what? You can actually apply the stuff from Linux from scratch uh, to build your own, uh, what is it, uh, locally hosted uh, virtual machine, which is super cool. And people have done that, actually. Uh, I'm going to put a plug in for another streamer who I really admire, uh, Gamozo, G-A-M-O-Z-O, I believe, who has written operating systems in Rust uh, that are Linux-like, they're not Linux, and he writes them to test uh, software through something called fuzzing, which is trying to break uh, something. And so these days you can actually build your own, literally build your own operating system much more easier. But that's a that's a tangent I love to go down because it's personally something I'm very interested in uh, and it's related to Linux from scratch, of course. Um, but it's not particularly for beginners, even though, uh, yeah, if, if you can say you've built a Linux from scratch, that's like, that's like, you know, the gold star, you know, <laughs> the the top rank of, of, of Linux coolness uh, out there. There's nobody cooler than the person who's built their own Linux distro uh, out there in the Linux culture. Uh, okay, so let's go back and do these one at a time. I just want to give you a quick overview. Uh, so preloaded hardware, single board computers. Uh, pretty much everybody has probably heard of Raspberry Pi. So what is a Raspberry uh, Pi? And PI, by the way. So you can buy these on Amazon. Uh, I'm going to go to the Raspberry Pi org site, and uh, there's a let's let's let them answer their own question. Raspberry Pi is well, actually I don't even need. Oh look, there's my music. Okay, let's do this. Let's actually. I think this one I can actually read. Oh wow, they have lots of weird highlighting. Uh, uh, so here we go. The Raspberry Pi is a low cost credit card sized computer. In fact, I have one right here. Yay, visuals. So this is a Raspberry Pi. Um, and as you can see, it's it's pretty cool. It's got, you know, I mean, there's so many YouTube videos on Raspberry Pis. You can go look at it. The really cool thing about it, it's called an, a single board computer. Uh, a single board computer means that it has uh, the CPU, which I'm pretty sure is this one right here. And then the GPU, that's a graphics card right here. And, and they're all on one, you know, computer. Uh, how is this different than an Arduino, by the way? Does the studio audience know? What's the difference between an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi? Ready, go. I'm going to take a coffee drink. All right, go, chat. What's the difference between a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino? Not really. Arduino is a potato. <laughs> Where it's made? No. Different brands. No graphics? Okay. Arduino is actually, well, that's kind of, you yeah. know. Hmm. Okay. Arduino is a microcontroller. A Pi is an embedded Linux system. Woo! That's a pretty damn close answer. Arduino is based on a microcontroller. Computer versus microcontroller. Laction. Perfectly answered. Arduino is a microprocessor. Yes. Uh, it's good for the man in the middle of tax. Basically, you build everything yourself. All right. So, lots of great answers from there. Uh, the, the, the most pedantic and shortest answer is uh, that this is a microcomputer and an Arduino, which I don't have with me right now. Uh, is a microcontroller. And so then the question becomes, what's the difference between a microcomputer and a microcontroller? And I used to always ask this question to myself. And I finally think I figured it out. If I got it wrong, let me know, guys. But an Arduino, a microcontroller has everything on it. So on the chip, it actually has its own RAM. It has everything it needs on a single chip. Uh, it doesn't break out all of the, the, the pieces that make a computer up. Uh, and in a micro, which is, I think is funny that it would be called a microcontroller. So, um, so yeah, so a micro, a microcomputer has a CPU on one chip and it has RAM on another chip specifically. Uh, it has, you know, timers and, and other, um, sequencers and things on other chips. So, uh, a microcomputer, um, breaks up the, the functions of a computer onto different chips. Um, whereas the microcontroller, has all of those things on a single chip, and um, and that ranges in size and and stuff. So you know, like microchip pick microcontrollers are super tiny. 
uh, you, you know, there's basically everything you need for a computer. So a microcontroller is a computer, but not in the traditional sense that we think of a computer. It has everything needed to do computation on a, on a single chip, uh, which makes it so you can like put it in like, I don't know, like Christmas lights or something like that. That little chip has all the pieces it needs. It has the RAM and everything all built into it. Uh, whereas, you know, a computer is a little bit different. I wasn't planning on doing that definition here. I thought microcomputers were made for Microsoft. No, no, no. Uh, actually, Microchip is, uh, is the name of a company that makes most of the of the, the microcontrollers in our world. And if you really want to get into microcontrollers, by the way, um, there's, a, there's a product called Gula Gum. Uh, this is not related to Linux um, so much. Um, to hardware engineers, they see both dollars and can save. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, microcontrollers are tinier. There's less stuff to deal with. Uh, what is Gula Gum? So I, I, this is just kind of a tangent for those people who want to get into this. So Gula Gum Electronics is this, this really great guy. Uh, I forget his name. Uh, yes, um, he's down in Australia who makes this really great board. In fact, I might have one. Where is my Gula Gum board? Where are you? Where are you, Gula Gum board? Here it is. Okay. I mean, I might as well. I'm not pushing this guy's stuff. I'm not getting profit off of anything. So, actually, here is... Um, uh, all right. So, this is the Gula Gum board. And uh, so, here... Okay. So, here we go. So, these right here, you see them? All right. So, this is a microcomputer. And each one of these chips, each one of these chips is a microcontroller. So, you know, people think of an Arduino when they think of a microcontroller, but that that is a microcontroller all by itself. That is a microchip pick. Which one is it? That's the 16F. Yeah. So anyway, computers get really small. I should probably do a thing just on that. Uh, and this, by the way, this board that goes with it um, is, is super cool. If you want to learn assembly in the most entertaining way possible. So this is a training board. It's from Gula Gum Electronics. Uh, I, again, I have nothing to do with them other than I really, really like what they do. I want to actually rewrite all their tutorials because they're kind of, they're kind of like hard to, they're kind of dense, <laughs> not in terms of stupid, they're dense in terms of like lots of information. Uh, and they, you learn how to code in assembly and then into C. Uh, so this is a really fun little project. And the way they teach you assembly is you learn like the different chips as you work up. Uh, not directly related to Linux, but we are talking about electronics a little bit. So, um, and believe me, that is a real rabbit hole. That is a fun rabbit hole to go down to. Uh, put that in the chat, or do you need both one and one to control? Um, yeah. Anyway, so that's this is called a single board computer. Uh, there's other uh, types besides uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, does not hold up anymore. Modern microcontrollers are more like yesterday's uh, SOC architecture. Uh, with the big difference being performance cores and maybe a menu. That's probably true, um, uh, Mac. I agree. I agree with you. That's true for most today. Would you? Would you agree, Mac? That because I'm not an electronics engineer. Let me just put it out there. So many Frank. Where's Frank? Frank is our electronics engineer. The guy has, knows his stuff. Um, so these microchip pick controllers. Would it be fair to say about them? Would that be a fair distinction? So, I mean, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to tell anybody wrong. And this is, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not an electronics engineer. So I would seek out an electronics engineer to ask them about those things. But I do feel confident <laughs> that calling this a single board computer is true. Uh, and then it's a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> You are a hardware software engineer. Yes, those are microcontrollers, old school ones, right? So the new school ones come with much more on them, right? And so you know, I think you're, but we're, not, but as soon as you get an ARM, as soon as you're talking about ARM, guys, right? How's it going? As soon as you get into ARM chips, then you're starting to talk about that. So let's talk about that too. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into the hardware. Uh, uh, our computer can run many OS, microcontroller can't. Yes, that's another big distinction. Uh, generally speaking, uh, a computer has an operating system. Uh, if you were going to get really pedantic, I'm almost sure one of our hardware engineers would let, would, would tell us we're wrong. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, real time operating system. And then you're just asking for bad time. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's actually, uh, operating systems that are just basically big loops. Uh, they're big C loops uh, and they call them operating systems. So at that point, you know, your definitions of operating system get kind of weird. You know, it's like looking at, you know, subatomic particles, they start to behave like, <laughs> waves one moment and then you know so uh you probably don't want to start with arm and that's 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 actually what i was talking about guys so i'm glad we heard that from somebody who knows 
uh, if you want to start, I the I, the whole basis of the Google Gum Electronics approach to learning uh, microcontrollers is to start small. He starts with an 8-bit pick, which barely has anything on it, and so the assembly that you learn for that um, that that chip is a simpler assembly. The assembly is different for every piece of hardware that exists. Um, so it's kind of fair to say that there's not one assembly language. It's really, really radically different depending on the chip because it's so close to the hardware. Um, and the Google Gum approach is to simplify the chips and therefore simplify the assembly language code that you're learning for that chip and then to move up. And so let's talk about, let's talk about ARM. Uh, this conversation is important to this, to this first conversation about uh, how do we get these single board computers? So back to Linux, uh, if you want Linux, you go buy a Raspberry Pi. Uh, that's one fast way to get it. Uh, and we already talked about Raspberry Pis a little bit. Uh, but let's, let me just give you the, the like two sentence history of Raspberry Pi. Uh, so what is Raspberry Pi? Uh, so uh, we'll go to the Raspberry Pi is a series of small single board computers developed by, in the United Kingdom by the Raspberry Pi Foundation to promote teaching and basic computer science. I've, as I've heard this story, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there are a couple guys at Oxford uh, that, who shall remain unnamed, I don't know them, uh, who were encountering a bunch of people who weren't tinkering anymore. And they're like, well, what can we do to promote more tinkering, you know, like sort of in your garage kind of tinkering with electronics um, that, you know, kind of led us to the PC innovation of our day. And so they invented this single board computer and designed it. And that's since become like a worldwide success for all kinds of things, including, you know, hacking and 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 any kind of automated device and pirate radio and all kinds of things like that. Uh, but the but the the fundamental uh, thing that allowed them to make a computer this big is ARM. Uh, ARM are ARM is a series of microchips uh, that are full computer chips and you're, that, that were made for mostly for mobile devices like phones. And so your phones are running off these really low power, ro low heat ARM chips. Um, but to say them low power, as in low power, not powerful would be a lie these days. Um, the ARM chip architecture, because it threw out all of the old architecture and started new, uh, is really fast. In fact, it's getting really, really fast. We're going to start to see, um, you know, personal computers running off ARM chips instead of the old and busted, you know, legacy uh, Intel uh, architecture. In fact, ARM is so powerful and so fast that Intel themselves have licensed the ARM architecture so they can keep up uh, because ARM came from AMD. Did I get that right? Let me see if I got that right. Uh, where, let's see, who invented uh, ARM chips? I think I got that right. Uh, ARM architecture from Wikipedia. Uh, ARM is from England. Oh, thanks. Risk-based uh, architecture. So it is risk-based. I didn't realize. Okay. Uh, and I mean, I haven't gotten that deep into the woods on this. Uh, While well, ARM is dominating the embedded world, it will not for long. Risk five is coming. Interesting. Uh, open source ISIS support for all major. That'll be really interesting because Risk was a big deal back in the Mac IBM days. So the, by the way, the beginners out there, if you're watching, we're just talking about different architectures or different ways that these microchips work in our computers. Almost all personal computers today have uh, Intel, you know, x86, uh, x64. Uh, chips in them and and they will for a long time but they're really hot and they're kind of kludgy and they have to I actually once talked to a microchip engineer uh, who worked at Intel while I lived in Oregon and he was telling us that it was really hard because they had to make it 100% backward compatible forever uh, they didn't ever have a chance so imagine writing a program and never being able to go back and change anything you had to leave everything there when you move forward otherwise you break everything um, and so that was a problem and that level of technical debt that's accrued over time has allowed ARM to be a really uh, fun alternative. And so people are like, you know, smelling the blood in the water. They're like, we need a new chip architecture. Sounds like risk five might be another one. Uh, so if you're wondering what all this is about, why you care, uh, because the Raspberry Pi has an ARM chip on it, it allows it to be smaller, but also is very, very low power. Uh, so um, this is why I went into the chip tirade uh raspberry pi computers are slow even the newest ones the four that i just tested 
uh, it, finally, it can run a Minecraft server with reasonable speed. Uh, but forget about compiling your Java Minecraft server using build tools and uh, with Spigot. And that, thankfully, you don't have to do that anymore with paper. Uh, long story there. Watch another video for that on how to do that. Uh, but my point is, if you try to compile things on ARM chips, be ready to wait a very long time uh, because it's just not fast at all. I mean, it is, you know, it's... It's it's not it's not fast, so so that's what the only downside of a Raspberry Pi. Lots of cool upsides. It's small. It's cheap. You can put it in the corner. You can run a you know a minimal server on it. Maybe not a Minecraft server. You can on the four, but you know you could be pushing it right. Uh, and you know you you can be cool uh, practicing it that way. It will run. Uh, it will power your your big old screen or your monitor just fine. Uh, and it's super portable, so you can take it with you, and it draws power off of USB. So you can pretty much plug it in, go to your, you know, your neighbor's house. Well, not these days, but you know, you can go to somebody's house and plug it in and, and try all, all a bunch of things on it. Uh, uh, but the Raspberry Pi in a few years is going to be a little bit faster for that kind of thing. There's all kinds of stuff you can search for on it with the Pi. Uh, massive. It, it's kind of like a huge sandbox of things that you can do. Um, the thing that's really great about it. So my wife does art. And she's coded a lot of stuff uh, that uses the Raspberry Pi. Like, we haven't done it yet, but anticipated to use the Raspberry Pi because we can code up whatever we want and then send you know electrical signals to these little GPIO pins here, and we can make things happen in the real world. You know, like we can run robots with it, uh, and we can you know make art with it that behaves in, you know, interactively in different ways. And so for that reason. Uh, yeah, GPIO. So for that reason, the Raspberry Pi is like really fun, and and so you might want to try that. So I spent a lot of time on that, and I put it first because it's really the easiest way for you to get Linux and get started in Linux. Uh, there's a really funny video of of a of a of an English girl poning her dad uh, using it. I'm not gonna pull it up, but I, I'll show you where it's at. Uh, so it's actually on YouTube. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Raspberry Pi uh, girl owns. Uh, that's probably not. How do I put this? Pwned. Um, SSH. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can find it. I mean, you can just do a search on the internet. I I don't want to do all the YouTube searching for you. I, but I this there's this girl, this English girl. I hope this doesn't pull up anything bad. <laughs> <laughs> so uh it's old if she ssh is into i've got into his computer i should have queued this one up you guys know what i'm talking about raspberry pi uh ssh girl mac she 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 uses a raspberry pi to hack into her dad's Mac. There it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to play it for a second. I'll stop. I'll go back. She's so funny. I got my daddy's permission before I did this. I'll put up a few videos. Well, talk to you about the shell. To show you more about the shell and teach you more about the shell. <laughs> so Just awesome. imagine, you got your Raspberry Pi, you may have got it for Christmas, your birthday, or you may have saved up for one. <laughs> and you've been playing a bit of Minecraft, a bit of Connect 4, and maybe even a bit of Scratch and uh, um, programming. Well, just... Might have done like Python programming. Maybe Python. And then you discover the secrets Secret. of the shell. <laughs> That night, you're lying in bed thinking, if only you had your dad's password, you could connect to his shell from your shell and play just a clear genius trick on him. That night, you can't sleep, you can't eat breakfast, and <laughs> school seems to take so long. And then but you go up, you and six years later, you're, you're working for the intelligence agency. <laughs> She's just so awesome. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna let you go watch her on your own. I don't want to steal away from from her from her wonderful. Uh, thing I'll put the music back on and hopefully I won't blow your ears out. Yeah, so let me just say I am like such a fan of that video. And the, the, the other reason I wanted to show you, yeah, duh, I'll give you the link. Uh, here's the link. Um, share. I'm, I'm glad we did this because I'm going to go ahead and put this in the 
in the in the, the document as well sorry guys oh boy share copy what <laughs> i'm failing you there we go guys now yeah, somebody else actually got the copy you're fat you beat me to it i'm like too slow anyway why did I spend so much time on that, the Raspberry Pi? Because the Raspberry Pi is a really great way to get to it. I like that video because it shows how easy it is to use Linux and how easy it is to get started. It's really not hard. Don't be scared. Uh, you can get Linux just by buying it, log in and use it. Okay, so that's the first way. Uh, and I, 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 even if you do any of these other ways that we're gonna talk about, that is still one of the most entertaining ways to get going. Uh, and we have many people suggest that that's the best way to get going with Linux. Uh, okay, so preloaded hardware. You can actually buy computers, uh, and I'm going to quickly go through. Um, uh, Linux is easier. Some people think it is, uh, and that's kind of a yeah a thing that's out there. I'm not going to actually visit every one of these vendors. Uh, you're smart people. You can do that on your own, but I did want to name them for you. So if you want to buy a computer that has Linux preloaded on it, uh, you can go to you can go to System76, Purism. Uh, uh, Lenovo and Dell, these, all these companies are, they're the only couples I know of currently that sell hardware, computers, servers, desktops, all of that with Linux pre-installed. I'm going to look at one because I got to show you, even though I had a really horrible, I actually bought a, a laptop from System76 in 2013 and had a horrible customer service experience. Uh, it was so slow and unusable and it was three times the cost of something that I could buy at Walmart and put Linux on. Uh, and I just did not have a good experience. I made me pay a $75 restocking fee. Uh, yeah, and System76 is it's an American company, so they have to you know charge American prices. Uh, but they make some pretty awesome, beautiful computers. I won't lie. Uh, there's 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 uh, there's one that I'll let you guys find that that has a sort of a wood grain cabinet that's got I think a, a Ryzen in it. It's got, got 64 cores. Uh, so the hardware is definitely man man magnificent. Um, System 76, it's been, I mean, what, nine, 10 years since that, that experience I had happened. So I'd love to give them a chance again. Um, they, they also created Pop! OS, which, which I really like uh, for beginners. This is something I was a little leery of when it came out and I tried it and I used it with really young beginners and they've all successfully been able to install it on their own computers. No problem, uh, and whether it be uh, hosted or right on the hardware, which we'll get to. So I'm, I'm kind of impressed with System76 lately. Uh, someone says here, I put Mint on my laptop for my wife so she can journal. I use it for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And I ran Linux. Um, I had four very young kids. Uh, the oldest they were the oldest was like 12. Uh, and they used Linux on the kitchen computer for years and didn't even know it. Uh, so it just depends on what you're going to be using it for. Uh, okay. So I'm going to jump past those different computers that you can go get and buy that have it on there already. Um, and most of the time though, I'm just going to tell you buying a computer with Linux on it is, is kind of the only thing you're really getting for that is you're getting a computer that, you know, will run Linux. Uh, generally speaking, at least in system 76 and purisms, uh, you're going to pay more money, um, a lot more money. And you know, I, I feel like, so, um, I feel like you can go down. So Linus does tech. He reviewed, uh, a Walmart special. It's a laptop that costs like 200 bucks. You can go down and buy that and put Linux on there and be good to go. Um, and, and I've done that. I bought Acer's for 200, 300 bucks for the mentoring community that I have here. And they, they are still kicking strong running Linux. Um, and I, so that's the same with Lenovo and Dell. Dell, I've had mixed experiences with some big or some bad. The only reason these, these manufacturers are listed here is because they actually produce hardware that you can buy with Linux on it. But the point I'm making here is you really don't need to buy hardware with Linux on it. Okay. You can put it on yourself. And that's what this bullet points about replacing hardware on the operating system. And this is not a video about how to install Linux. Uh, this, I just want to tell you that it's a possibility. And there is another video. There's tons of videos about how to do this on YouTube or other, other places. Um, and mine will be one of many among them. Uh, nice. Uh, you should dig into it. Yeah. Uh, it looks pretty fun. Uh, so, uh, in terms of hardware on your OS though, the, this is generally how it works. Uh, you download software off of the internet. Uh, that is 
checksum so you can make sure it doesn't get, you know, you don't get the wrong thing. And then you flash an image to a USB stick. So that means you take a USB drive and put Linux on it, uh, create what's called a live boot USB stick. And then you stick it in your laptop or your desktop and then you turn it on. And, and then when you doesn't run Linux, well, I don't, I does it really, uh, a Linux support. Oh, wow. That's not good. I'm glad you're putting it out there for us to see. So we've got somebody with a bad experience with Lenovo. Um, uh, but so, yeah. And then you, so you boot from the USB stick and you, you, you have to, there's the hardest part of the whole process is telling your computer to use the USB as your hard drive instead of the hard drive built inside of your computer. Uh, and so when it starts up, it starts up using the USB drive to run everything and that frees it up. So it can actually install, you click on a button or the, an icon and say install, and it will install Linux onto the hard drive. You have to put it onto the right hard drive. And then when you reboot your computer, huzzah, you'll have Linux. It's not as hard as most people think. I've had people as young as 10 just randomly do it on their own uh, from home when they wanted to do a re-image. Uh, particularly now that there are tools to help you do that that are very reliable. Uh, we're not going to get into a debate about that right now, but there's a tool called Belena Etcher, uh, which runs on any major OS, which very reliably flashes a USB image for you. So you don't, it takes a lot of the hassle out of that that used to exist before with tools like Rufus and DD and stuff like that. Um, and please don't debate about that right now. We'll cover that on, on an actual video where we go through all that. My point is, is that you can find old hardware and it's funny because we've had people with our hardware that was made in 2000 even earlier and I, we had one guy actually boot windows 98 he had oregon trail on there and everything and he um uh yeah people always say that rufus is an option on windows and i'm gonna strongly advise you against that suggestion and, and i make my case uh, in a video um the only thing you should be using is Etcher. I cannot tell you how many times Rufus has failed to do what it's advertised to do. Uh, Etcher has never failed me once, nor any of the other people I've had use it. Rufus has failed people multiple times. So my recommended tool for that is Etcher, and we can debate that. I tr try to not get that debate going right now. Usually when we have the imaging debate, somebody else will say, oh, just use DD. And, and I don't want to talk about that right now. Just understand that the process of flashing an image to a USB, uh, there's some debate about the best way to do that right now. And um, hands down, my recommendation is to use a product called Balena Etcher. I have nothing to do with them, E-T-C-H-E-R, uh, primarily because it makes the process easy. It has a full checksum validation, uh, which DD does not do and which Rufus does not do. So that makes sure that you didn't make a, a broken USB stick. Those other tools don't do that. So that's why I would suggest doing them. Uh, there will be a separate video on that, but if you want to jump into it, uh, that's kind of an overview of how to do that. This might be a shorter video than I thought. Well, no, who knows? Uh, the, another method to do it is to live boot. And to live boot is when you, you, you do all that step up here about replacing your hardware. You download an image, you make a USB stick, same thing. But instead of, uh, and, and you do the boot, but instead of running the installer, you just run from it. So this is really popular with pen testers and cybersecurity people, particularly with Kali or Parrot or something, is they will boot their computer off of a USB stick or even in a completely external hard drive, and they will run off of that. And so it doesn't mess with what's on their hard drive there. That That's really great because that allows you to, um, uh, I, you know what, I forgot something here. I just realized uh, dual boot. Um, I should probably put this under thing, dual boot. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so a live boot means, uh, so a live boot means that you boot off the USB stick, and whether or not you can make it persistent, which means that anything that you change during your session stays on the USB stick. So next time you boot from it, it remembers. Uh, it's a little tricky to do that, but it's definitely possible. Uh, most of the time when people live boot, though, uh, they're the first really popular live boot. Uh, was a thing called uh, Nopix, K-N-O-P-P-I-X. Some people might remember it. Uh, it was the first uh, time to they could boot from a CD-ROM and you could run your entire operating system from a CD-ROM. Obviously, you couldn't write back to the CD-ROM, but it was a great way to fix things that were broken on a system or to hack into a system because it bypassed all of the security of the host operating system. Uh, so that's what a live boot is. A live boot means sticking a, a drive or USB stick or something and restarting the computer so that it uses that USB as the hard drive and runs off of that. 
Uh, and that's a very um, common system administration method for fixing things that are not working on the system uh, that you can't fix because they're being used. So by doing that, you can get access to that. Um, and so that's whether it's for security or just because you don't want to take over what's on your hard drive uh, or whatever. Um, that's that's one way to do that. Uh, I did forget to mention uh, something that's kind of in between those two, which is called dual booting. And this has kind of fallen out of favor. Uh, people will fight me on this. Uh, dual booting means to rather than replacing the operating system on your hard drive, that you scoot it out of the way. <laughs> you basically take that hard drive and cram everything that's on the hard drive into half the space or so or something. And then you, so you're messing with the hard drive that's on there, right? And that's where it gets scary. Uh, and you're messing with that stuff. And then you're making room to have Linux on the same hard drive. And um, you can do dual booting with a separate disk and all that. But mostly that when people refer to dual booting, they're meaning that they want to boot off the same hard drive and they've made half of the hard drive for Linux and half of the hard drive for whatever was there before, particularly Windows. So this computer I'm on right now is actually dual booted. It boots to Windows 10 or it boots to Linux Mint. Uh, and the reason that I'm running Mint is because it's a stable OS. It's great for streaming and it has great support. Uh, not because it would be my preferred operating system for development or for hacking for anything. It's just the right tool for the job. And that's why I picked this distro at this for this purpose. Um, and don't let anybody tell you what distro to pick uh, until they ask you what you want to do. Uh, you really need that. And we're going to get into the distro war a little bit later on here. But... Uh, we'll talk about that. So if you do a boot, best use two separate SSDs for it. I agree. So if you have two hard drives, you're, you're, you're dual booting. Both of the hard drives are in the computer, but you don't, you're not messing with the one hard drive to make room for the other operating system, which can get really messy. So if the other operating system doesn't like it, so like this is in the old days, Windows, it would say, oh, you got some foreign thing over here. We got to get rid of that. And it can blow away your Linux distro. I've had that happen before. Uh, and the opposite is also true. You can also have Linux kind of overreach and maybe make a mistake and end up bricking or getting rid of your of your your in this case Windows um, operating system. So dual booting is not for the faint of heart. Uh, the most seamless dual booting process I've ever gone through uh, is Linux Mint, which lets you just graphically change it and then just click do it, and it does it pretty reliably. In fact, so much so that I've gone, I've changed my policy on it here with people I private mentor. And if they do have a, bring me a laptop that's got windows on it, I'll say, yeah, let's set up a dual boot. Uh, if they have enough SSD usually, um, if they don't, you know, then I, I recommend against it. Uh, but generally speaking, it's safer to you know go. I swear you will find a computer like in the closet someplace or that somebody's not using that you think is no good. And you'll put Linux on there and you can change the Linux version Linux distro that you put on there uh, to 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 find a good you know the Linux that you want to put on there and you can bring new you can breathe new life into old hardware which has become something of an obsession of mine uh, back when I had a garage I used to have it filled with old hardware and I would my I would take great pride in you know picking the right Linux for the hardware and you can put all kinds of great hardware uh, back to life um, by just breathing new life with Linux back onto it. Because remember, Linux can run on tiny, tiny little computers that are so small they can, you know, run a toaster or refrigerator. So you can size up and down the Linux that's running on the thing uh, depending on how big the computer is. And that's not something you can do with Windows or, or Apple, right? Macintosh, because you don't have the choice. They're constantly pushing the boundary so they can sell you more hardware. And it kind of sucks, actually. So so Linux is really great at opening up all those doors for you. All right. So let's go down here. Uh, again, most of this is for discussion. You can go do the research yourself. You guys are all autodidacts. You don't need me to browse for you. Um, locally hosted. Okay. Um, uh, dual booting was recommended for people for Linux for some time. Yeah, it used to be. And I, I actually have talked to several people who don't recommend that any, anymore. Uh, including some uh, YouTubers that I shall not name. Uh, so it's it's generally not a good idea. It's it's easier to boot off of another USB drive, and there are some pretty damn fast USB drives now uh, with USB three. So uh, if you want to run off you know a full Unix distro off of a separate hard drive, you can often do that now just with a US with with this external USB drive, uh, and 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 save yourself the pain of a dual boot. Uh, okay. Uh, 
get another PC and just jam Linux on it. Most people still recommend that. Windows machine, yeah, so much easier. Uh, Linux dual booting, but when you could not game on Linux, I wouldn't save Linux if it had been my only OS. Yeah, uh, SSDs are cheap. Yeah, all of those reasons are reason to not uh, mix the two. Uh, let me give you another reason, particularly since we're gamers here on Twitch. Um, so uh, Hitachi, uh, I mean, Hikari Knight, if you haven't heard from him, he has shown overwhelmingly uh, that you can pretty much do any gaming on Linux now, uh, depending on you know how you're set up, including, which I want to set up soon, uh, streaming, so local streaming. So you can have a Windows machine and you can stream to your Linux machine and you can play with full you know, like FPS uh, from the other system because the bandwidth in your house is so high uh, that you don't you don't have the lag that you would you would uh, see. So yeah, Hukari Knight is the whiz on this. So so you combine the the reduction in cost for external storage. You combine the speed of, of, of USB hard drives. You combine the ability to stream your gaming from another local PC in your house. And you put those things together. You really don't need a dual boot anymore. Uh, so so in fact, I have a dual boot here. I never use it. I never booted kind of wasted the disk space probably should have just used it because on an ssd you know the disk space is not as big as it used to be anyway so uh, yeah pat we, yeah so there we go um so local live local uh live hosting yeah please check out hikari knight watch his videos uh he doesn't have a lot of people watching because because he does stuff that's so high end but he does all this all of his graphics pass through he, he he was doing it before anybody else and he's got maybe got like multiple documents on it uh, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. Uh, he also has a video about how to just uh, um, uh, screen, you know, stream, uh, which is really awesome. And I really want to set that up. I haven't done it yet. Anyway, so let's keep moving forward. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, it's Google Stadia. I, I don't know about the Google Stadia. <laughs> That's a good lull. Um, so locally hosted. So we talk about live, but now let's talk about this. Um, we're taking a drink of coffee. Give myself some more energy. Mm. All right. We're about to talk about one of the most complicated and amazing technologies uh, that we are privileged to experience in our lifetimes. And that is uh, virtual machine hosting, hypervisor, containers, all of this stuff. It's all related to a fundamental technology that allows us to essentially and effectively run one computer inside of another computer. And if you haven't heard of this and you're new to the field, um, just understand that it very much is running a computer inside of another computer. And the two computers have names. The one is called the host and the other is called the virtual machine usually. And so, um, and people may not know this, but containers of virtual machines are leveraging the same technology. Uh, I don't want to get into the weeds on the technology. I just want to tell you uh, that they exist and that they are a way for you to run it right now. This is actually something I do want to demonstrate to you. So by running a VMware workstation, uh, I can pull up. I do this on stream all the time. Uh, I can run a workstation and you can see here. Uh, remind me later. I think this might be down. So I can actually, this is a frozen system. I'm just waking up uh, my Windows system. Uh, what you're looking at now is a fully functional uh, Windows machine that is running inside of my Linux machine. This is PowerShell, uh, Windows. It's a little slow right now because it's I'm streaming and everything. But as you can see, I can do all my testing here. This is a uh, an official license. They, they Windows is actually pretty cool. They give you free versions, free virtual machines uh, to sample everything. So, and they're all pre-packed with all the stuff that's going to be coming out. Um, so, uh, it's very frequent that I need to show how to use windows or something like that. But as you can see, uh, I was able to turn on a computer and turn it off very quickly, uh, many times faster than I could do it if I were doing it with actual power. So that is a virtual machine. Uh, you need to pick, uh, some software to use for a virtual machine, uh, um, actually, IBM invented the technology um, and something called a hypervisor uh, way back when. And I won't get into all of that, but the first one to make it commercially viable and to really get fame from it was VMware, which is now kind of falling out of favor. It's still very expensive. The last I checked, it was still $280. Uh, that's the one you saw me just use. 
Um, VirtualBox is free. It's a technology that is now owned by Oracle that they bought uh, that is maintained pretty well. It has some quirks, but it's hands down the most popular virtual machine software uh, for a true virtual machine. We're talking about the graphics. Uh, we're talking about um, you know everything that you might want. Networking. We had a network engineer, LTN Bob, was telling me that in some cases, uh, the virtual machines perform better than the host machine in terms of networking, which really surprised me. He had a great explanation of that. LTN underscore Bob, by the way, is a Twitch streamer who does this. Uh, one of my best friends and uh, a great streamer uh, with, with a lot of network background. Uh, so Windows WSL2 uh, is... Windows WSL2, which is which was just officially released, uh, I think, what was it, May 15th? Uh, it's been around for a long time. WSL1 has been around for a long time. 1 and 2, the WSL stands for the Windows Subsystem for Linux. Uh, this is a virtual machine. Uh, it, strictly speaking, it's more of a container than a virtual machine. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. But this is the reason I put it first is it's hands down the fastest way to get a true virtual machine uh, on Windows because it comes with modern Windows 10. Uh, you still have to install it if you've had a, a, anything, any operating system that's older than like a month or so. Um, you know, you still have to upgrade it and go through a, a number of steps, which I document on rdvx.gg. They're not that hard. I've had 10-year-olds go through it with no problem. Uh, but, you know, you just need to know you have to still do those steps. Uh, but the world is changing, people. I mean, because you can uh, WSL2. Yeah, WSL2 is way, way better. Um, uh, yeah, WSL2 is a is Linux that ships with Windows, uh, and the two live together. Um, and it still uses the 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 hardware uh, modifications that exist now in pretty much every computer to do accelerated uh, virtual hosting. You know, hypervisor. Um, but it's you know it's it oh the, uh, you still have to do some work to get graphics and stuff uh but it is there but if you tr if you um uh well a lot of people have mixed feelings about microsoft uh my personal opinion of microsoft has radically changed if 90s rob could could hear you know 2020 rob talking you like who are you uh, because Microsoft has proven over and over again that its that its position on on Linux has radically changed, and my reason for that is largely uh, come from watching hours and hours of videos uh, at the last uh, build conference and the last um, micro the 2019 build conference where they're talking about Linux. They're interviewing the Linux team. Uh, they're talking about the terminal that they upgraded. Uh, you know, they've, they've got a Linux department now. They have several core contributors who are real Linux people. These are not people that have been bought in. They've had a relationship with Susie for a long time. Uh, none of the original, um, you know, leadership is there. Uh, the new leadership is very heavily into cloud and understands the importance of Linux for the cloud. I could go on and on, but but I truly believe that... Um, uh, uh, might keep MS more honest. I, I think there needs to be skeptics of Microsoft as you, as, as with any company. Uh, I'm personally more scared of Google than any other company right now. Uh, but that's another conversation um, because of what they've demonstrated. Uh, Microsoft is not perfect by any means. They're still a corporation out for a corporate profit. But but the things that they've done for the Linux community are, are pretty substantial recently, uh, including shipping Linux with their operating system. Uh, and that is a big deal. That means that they actively are promoting the use of Linux. Uh, and I'm not going to fault them for that. You know, people will say, well, they're trying to whatever. I don't know. The, the, end, the end result is you buy a, 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 you know, a Windows machine in a year, it will have Linux on it by default. Uh, in addition to the underlying Microsoft operating system. And if you're a beginner hearing this, you're like, oh, yeah, I want that. I mean, and I use this constantly with beginners, very young beginners uh, who are running Ubuntu uh, as um, a terminal uh, within their Windows system without a problem. So that is my number one recommended way for you to have your first uh, Linux experience if you have a Windows system. It is the least impact. Uh, it's the fastest way to get going. Uh, it's terminal centric, which is just consistent with everything else I've been talking to you about. So I still uh, recommend that. I up till very recently I recommended installing VirtualBox and then installing Pop OS, uh, which I still think is a great way if you want a full Unix, I mean Linux environment. That's uh, still a great way to do that. Uh, 
we, we won't, I haven't talked about distros. I'll let you have your own distro or make your own distro pick. Uh, that's a separate video. All LTN underscore B O B as his name. Yep. LTN LTN underscore B O B. Uh, so let me just say that VMware, uh, is my, still my go-to, uh, most corporations still use VMware. Uh, for example, Kali Linux, when you do the OSCP, um, there are things that are, they have VMware images downloaded. You can just download those and use those. So let's talk about containers. Uh, so containers are a way free from the command line. I'm not probably, I'm not going to try because I'll fail. Uh, you can just run from the command line. Uh, you can run Linux on your command line. Uh, let me just put a big disclaimer out here right now. Uh, you cannot run Docker containers and VirtualBox at the same time on a Windows system. Uh, they, there's a pretty big conflict between the two. Uh, so I don't recommend Docker containers. However, uh, if you're a Windows user, you, I'm sorry, a, a Mac user, uh, you have to pick, right? So if you're on a, uh, if you're on a, oh, if you're a Windows user, you have to pick, do I do VirtualBox? Do I pay the money for VMware? Uh, do I sell for not putting Linux on here at all and just using my terminal, which a lot of people do in the Mac world? Uh, or do I put a container on here with Docker and, you know, set it up so that I can use that regularly? Uh, if you're a brand new beginner, my recommendation still is going to be put VirtualBox on there and, and pick any number of your favorite uh, operating systems. The really great thing about VirtualBox uh, or VMware, frankly, is that you can test so many distros out. You can test them out. You can try out uh, your different favorite desktop operating system and see all of its graphic interface and and how you respond to that. Uh, and you, know, you might like Pop OS. You might like Linux Mint. You might like Ubuntu. You might like Manjaro, even though I hate it. Uh, you know, you might like Endeavor OS, which I would be more inclined to try. That's these are all really great beginner distros that are out there. Uh, that you can try, try before you buy kind of thing. And then you can see whether you like them or not. And even if you have a Mac, actually, you can put, uh, if you have, particularly if you have an old Mac, uh, you can put Linux on it. In fact, we had a guy uh, that I'm going to be meeting with later today uh, that I have a private mentor. He took an old, I think, 2015 MacBook Pro and he installed Pop! OS on it and it screams. Oh my God, it's so beautiful. So yeah, and Odeva is nice too. So basically, I want you to be able to pick which one. Uh, uh, yeah, use, use Docker on Linux and VBox on, on Windows. Okay, uh, uh, but why not Docker? Uh, waiting for Microsoft to just buy Canonical. Yeah, they might. Do. They're, I think get wrecked. I think they're maybe doing that with uh, Suzy. I think they have a closer relationship with Suzy than they do Canonical. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, anyway, uh, that so that those are all the options for you. Uh, if you're looking for the easiest way and you're a beginner, uh, and you have the hardware that will do it, I would suggest VirtualBox and then trying one of those five distros that I named. Uh, I should probably put that on there. But uh, Pop! OS, um, Linux Mint, uh, uh, Endeavor OS, which is Arch, and Manjaro OS, which is Arch. Uh, those are the four top recommendations for beginners. Um, uh, so, yeah. And so there you go. And then we go down here. We have Remotely Hosted. Um, uh, so remotely hosted is not running your own Linux at all. Uh, when I first started doing, uh, private mentoring, this is how I did everything. Uh, and I'll show you what that means, but that meant setting up a system someplace else. So let me just show you. So SSH, uh, so skill stack dot SSH. This is a, this is a system. Oops. I have to just, oops. I have an alias for it and I'm not going to give away much more than that. So, so as you can see, uh, I'm on a computer that is not my computer. It's a different computer and I connected to it remotely. So another way to do that would be, uh, to connect to, uh, there's a, a computer that you can get an account on. I'm going to go show you this. I'm going to make a plug for this, uh, this site in general. It's called Pico CTF, P I C O C T F. Uh, this was introduced to me by a lot of security uh, people and usually high schoolers who and college people who are doing competitions. So Pico CTF is a site um, and a capture the flag game that's annually run by Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University uh, that um, that includes uh, a full command line shell. Uh, 
and that's super awesome. I'm actually going to show you that, but you have to go ahead and log in and sign in. And um, I don't know if I want to do that right now on stream because I forgot. Uh, oh, that's what I forgot to log in. Give me one second. I'm going to go ahead and blind you guys for a second while I do this, just in case something doesn't work with my password manager. Do, 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 do. All right, so there we go. Um, and they unblind you. All right, there we go. Um, so, so this is Pico CTF. If you log into this, this doesn't cost you any money. Uh, everything that you do on Pico CTF is designed for those who want to participate in the Pico CTF game, which you can do on your own. They have, uh, you can click on the challenge problems, uh, and there are a number of these. I'm going to actually do a lots of walkthroughs on this. Um, is he good good enough i don't know um the point i'm trying to make here is that they have this thing so you click on shell and you get a shell and you can type in your username and everything and it's a full blown fully functional shell uh, uh that you you know can use for all kinds of stuff uh you can also remotely connect to this to this system using SSH. So you still have to have a terminal on your Mac or your Windows machine or your Linux machine in order to connect to this. But this is a place where you can go and get your own shell. I, there are actually 41,000 home directories. That means 41,000 users on this system. It's one of the largest multi-user systems I've ever seen. And it's a remarkable testament to the Carnegie Mellon team to maintain that many people on that system uh, safely and in a way that allows them to play the game. And it's a pretty, pretty awesome game. As I said, I'm going to continue to play more of those games uh, as part of a walkthrough. Uh, this is one of the reasons I really get behind this particular one, even though I was really triggered by all this Unity interface. Uh, there's a there's a version of the game that's all Unity driven. And I was like, really? I, I felt, it felt so kiddy. I got really triggered. But once I got over that, uh, I was able to, to show that this has got a lot of really great introductory uh, technology that might not necessarily be related to cybersecurity, uh, but is more related to the command line terminal and to things that you need should, should know in operation space. But, uh, but of course, for pen testing. Uh, the really great thing about this, though, is their next round is going to be in September. And if you win, if you place well, you can make a $20,000 scholarship for an American university. Um, so... I have nothing to do with this organization at all. I, I regularly bag on Carnegie Mellon for having crappy beginner Linux classes. Uh, but I will say this. I'm super impressed by the Pico CTF uh, and its ability to promote sort of interest and motivation in, in young people as well as old uh, to do things and to learn. And the fact that they've given uh, a free shell account uh, to do that work, and I really want to say that if you use that shell to practice your shell scripting that we're going through on the stream, that's fine. And that's within the realm of, of what you're learning that's in their scope of learning uh, because you're going to need to learn how to uh, shell script a little bit to pass some of the challenges. So that's totally okay. Um, but if you try to use it for something else, you know, then you're kind of you're kind of stretching that then by the way if there's any uh seasoned system administrators over there you should really go over there and look at how they've set up quotas and stuff it's one of the few places that i've seen uh quotas actually really effectively used normally quotas and stuff like that are not are not deployed uh to a production server uh, because they slow things down and other things like that but they've actually deployed a lot of the old school quotas and stuff that they're associated with unix and linux uh to great effect in order to protect the system it's really fascinating to just poke around over there and see how they've done that so that will be uh in the video of course <laughs> i'm gonna keep that in there uh, let me get back over here we're about done here so um uh, I've gone through uh, how you know where you would maybe put things, the containers uh, remotely hosted. Uh, I'm going to mention the other big boys, and again, you can do your own research and your own try. You are autodidacts. When I do videos, they are not going to be really detailed videos until we need a really detailed video. Otherwise, you're going to be totally fine doing this on your own. But a lot of times, you don't know it exists. So I just want to tell you that these things exist, so you can go off and 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 learn these things on your own and try them out. Uh, and then make a video yourself about how your, your experience was. So Pico CTF is the first one I'm going to list because it's free and you can use it right away. Um, and it, it provides a shell, by the way, which you can then SSH into. Uh, I won't do that right now, but um, you can actually just SSH and practice using that shell. Uh, there is another CTF game called Over the Wire, uh, which provides a shell that you can't even edit. So it's not worth listing here, but it does also use the shell. 
Uh, and um, other shells have this feature. Let's see, add an alias from the CLI. Yep. Uh, yeah, yep, yep. Bash RC will get it. Actually, let me make a note uh, on Pico CTF. If you know what uh, Bash RC is, uh, they've locked down Bash RC. So you have to, you can provide a Bash RC, but you have to put it in Bash underscore aliases instead. And then you can use that. So if you want a Vim RC or a Tmux RC or any of these things that are all separate topics, uh, you can do all those things over there. DigitalOcean is hands down my favorite uh, way to host uh, systems. And um, I think I might even have one open right now. Um, do I have one? Nope. If I don't, I'm, I'm just going to let you do your own research. If I had it open up, oh, there's one. All right. So here we go. So, um, so we have, uh, that's fine. That's going to go away anyway. This shows you my usage. It's, you can like start. In fact, let me, let me make a new project since I have it here. So let's say you wanted to create a new droplet. You click on create a, um, let's see. Oh, I'm going to go over here. New, not a new project. I don't want a new project. I want to do manage droplets. Uh, this is my favorite by far. This is my favorite way to get a, a, a new Linux system. And so I'm going to go back. Let me actually go back to my own account. You can also switch accounts. So you can have uh, groups that have an account. And then you can have uh, you can have an account that's just got its own here. Here's It has domain name management. You can click on manage uh, droplets. I can go ahead and create a new droplet. Check this out. Watch how fast this is. Click on create a droplet. And, and I, I mean, I'm, I have nothing to do with them. I'm not getting kickbacks or anything. I do. There is a way I think to send the referral link, uh, that would give me credits, but I, somebody told me that the other day on stream. I didn't, I wasn't aware if there is, that would be nice. But here's, you can see, here's the different distros. You can go pick a distro. You can choose a starter plan. I would not do the 40 bucks. You can go all the way to five bucks a month. Uh, you can add a volume if you want to have hard, uh, like a hard drive that sticks around. Even if your droplet dies, you can pick it anywhere from all over the place. Uh, I'm trying to get you to the fun part. Uh, authentication, you can send SSH keys up. Uh, I already have an SSH key, which I'll set up. Um, and then finalize it. Go. Ahead. You can actually add a whole bunch that are the same. Give it a tag if you want. Um, and give it a name. So, uh, like, delete me <laughs> is the name. And then we're going to click on, career, let's see, no, no backups, create droplet. Uh, and there it is. Watch how fast it makes it. Look at this. To somebody from my generation, this is this is downright miraculous. I mean, this is seriously miraculous. Um, you see what I'm saying? I mean, right there. And and I don't have my VPN running, uh, so I I'm not gonna um, try to connect to it. But right now, as you can see, you instantly have one you can log into with your SSH keys and start using it right away. And you can use it from anywhere. Uh, the disadvantage to running a hosted based system, I actually, it's not that much harder. This interface, by the way, is so totally worth using DigitalOcean. Uh, we talked about WSL2 already. Um, so so DigitalOcean is a way for you to, uh, to, to get a system right away that's super easy. Linode, Linode is listed here. Linode is another provider uh, that I am not particularly fond of. Um, Linode has had, uh, uh, somebody's going to yell at me, but they've had a long history. Uh, 2013 was the last major one where they were they were compromised in a way that the, the account information from their users was disclosed. Um, if I got that right, if I got that wrong, let me know. But let me just say this officially, uh, they've had security problems in the past. Um, and they continue to be a target of attack. And uh, although I don't have any direct experience with them, uh, when it comes to a hosting provider, it's all about trust. And uh, you get pilled, you get billed per hour. Yep, DigitalOcean. Yep, uh, you get you get billed per billed per hour. You don't get you don't pay for the whole month at a time. No. Uh, uh, you what? I don't know. Um, so no, that's I actually I really seriously consider Linode. I tried to sign up for them. Uh, they are billed per per month, as far as I know, at Linode. Um, and I, I went ahead and added back to the list here because I know a lot of people really love it and have had great experiences with it, but I, I would never use it personally. Um, I've had so much expected. DigitalOcean proactively disables, This is some people think this is a disadvantage. DigitalOcean proactively disables your host if it gets compromised. If it gets compromised and using any kind of denial of service attack, they'll shut your host down and send you a notification. Uh, and that can be catastrophic to some businesses and they hate that. They hate, hate, hate that that's a thing. 
Uh, Amazon, by the way, doesn't do that as much as far from what I'm gathering. I have had no experience with that. Uh, but I've had DigitalOcean nodes turned off because kids were setting them up and had stupid passwords and didn't use keys. And, and they, they I like that DigitalOcean is on that stuff. Uh, and my impression is that, that, that they're not on that in some Linode and Amazon. I tell you what, if somebody launches a denial of service attack from your computer and doesn't throttle your bandwidth or something, your bill is going to go through the roof. And, and I would rather have somebody shut down, uh, proactively detect a problem and shut down outbound traffic than wind up with a $70 bill. And my experience with DigitalOcean and from what I'm reading about DigitalOcean is that that is far more of a thing with DigitalOcean, uh, almost to a fault, right? That they'll shut it down without asking you uh, than Linode or Amazon or Azure or Google. Uh, these ones, you know, Amazon, Azure, and Google in particular expect you to know what you're doing and do your own auditing and stuff. And I, I, I have heard of people having massive Amazon bills uh, because they just let you do whatever. You know, they don't really particularly audit your stuff. I think they actually added a, a service that allows auditing. So if somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that Amazon has actually added a a, a monitored uh, option that that kind of proactively protects that protects you from that but that one of the biggest dangers of, of being hacked uh, in this world is not so much they're going to get your stuff that is the thing right but that somebody's going to use your computer against your will and you're going to get a huge bill uh, they're going to do some bitcoin mining over there or something like that so if you pick one of these hosting providers uh just be sure that you're ready to do your own uh, security auditing uh, and that you 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 um, have got backup. I got a huge Amazon Azure bill. They were kind enough to reimburse it. Lambda became popular because of the bills. Yeah, and so the stuff that I'm telling you is just kind of you know full disclosure stuff. Just be aware of this. If you're going to host a thing on the internet uh, and you're you're putting it on the internet, you could be hacked, and you could inadvertently cause something to run that that causes you to have a very high bill. Uh, although I've never had that on DigitalOcean ever, uh, and Amazon, Amazon gets annoying because they, even if you've going got one system and it's not doing anything, it'll still charge you fifty bucks a month. <laughs> I finally paid. That's like hey, we're going to turn you off, and they said it like for months because I had one little thing that was disabled forever, and they finally paid my six dollar bill, and it was no big deal. <laughs> so just be aware that you're doing your own auditing, and the system is on the internet, and that's a big deal. You really need to be okay with it. Uh, the reason I listed Pico CTF is because you kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, first of all, you get a server for free as long as you're playing Pico CTF stuff and you want to try out your terminal and learn it. Uh, but you also have, you know, the Carnegie Mellon team behind you that's backing you up and protecting the system. Uh, there are a couple of things about Pico CTF that I want to say very, and this is the last thing I'm going to say about hosting, and we'll probably about be wrapping up the video at this point. But the, there's something that's really important when you start to use a remote host. And it's particularly a remote host that has shared users, okay? Uh, when you're using a remote host with shared users, you are giving up your IP information, uh, okay? So uh, when you give up your IP information, which I have done so many times on the stream, I can't even count, <laughs> um, it, you're, you're putting yourself at risk. And so you need to be prepared for that risk. Uh, I'm probably more prepared than most uh, for that risk of, of what would happen if you give up. It's called doxing your IP. Uh, but if you dox your IP, uh, just know that you will be a target. You're already a target. Uh, this is a really uh, sort of disturbing thing. The first time I show this to somebody, uh, and I will make a video about this, but we'll go in and just, just to give you, if you guys want to do this, it's kind of fun. We'll go in, you make a digital ocean account like that one I just created, right? And then turn on your logs, like go tail your logs in real time. Watch your logs. Watch the failed uh, SSH login attempts on your logs. Watch the, the port scans. Watch all of the stuff and just capture all that stuff and watch it in real time. And you'll probably get maybe in, in 10 minutes, you'll probably get at least 10, maybe 20 uh, failed SSH login attempts. That's how much. Uh, and I'm going to say something else that's controversial, but it's a fact. Most of the failed connection attempts are coming from Chinese IPs. And that is, yep, there it comes. Uh, you guessed it, Lakshin. Uh, almost all of the failed uh, little robots scanning your stuff instantly. Yep. And if you look at where the IPs are coming now, whether or not the IPs are actually Chinese people attacking, uh, I don't know, or whether there are hackers that are going from there. 
Uh, but uh, the only way you can truly grasp this, this is why I'm describing this to you so you know what you're getting into, the 10 cent cloud. You betcha. Yep. And uh, and when you watch it in real time, when you watch the number of failed login attempts and scans in real time, you realize that it's beyond the Wild West out there. If you turn a system on on the Internet, you better be be damn ready to take on that responsibility because you will be hacked. You, it's just a matter of time. You will be hacked and you need to do things that help you to monitor your system for when it is attacked and to prevent yourself from being attacked uh, because it's just a matter of time. And so I, I'm not trying to tell you that to scare you, but I do want to, I at least want to put a healthy amount of respect for the decision to, to, to use a hosted system. You saw how easy it was for me to turn on a digital ocean. Guess what systems are getting hacked the most? <laughs> If I had so, I've had a dollar for every form entry that I've read on DigitalOcean by some kid who wanted to get his Minecraft server working, and all of a sudden he's been shut down because why? Because he's being used to DDoS, you know, Netscape or Net, Netflix or somebody. Um, because what happens is they're counting. It's things like DigitalOcean are so easy. It's so easy to put a computer on the internet now that that they're not being managed, and so hackers are just loving it, particularly Chinese hackers. And so they're getting on there and they're doing whatever they want. Uh, so there's, there's something you need to know. Don't give up your IP. If you're going to take on a cloud server, be, be safe about it. Uh, if you use Pico CTF, please, please use a VPN. And if you don't know what that means, go watch a video about it. Okay. You can watch it for me or anybody else. Say, I want to use a free VPN. How do I do it? Uh, if you don't know how to use a free BT, uh, B, uh, VPN, Proton VPN is the one I use and recommend. Uh, what a VPN does is you're using a terminal, so you don't need a lot of high performance um, stuff, which is why I don't use a VPN while I stream. It gets in trouble. It doesn't get me in trouble, but it kind of slows and messes with the stream. Uh, actually, I found out, just FYI, I found out that when I stream from a v while I'm on a VPN, it locks my bit rate. Yeah. So if, if, you, if I stream using a VPN, it automatically locks me to 1080p or to whatever my 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 settings are. It doesn't allow any transcoding ever. Uh, I don't know why that is. Um, it's it just that's my observation is that Twitch requires it um, because of your VPN. Yep, it was because of my VPN election. Yep, I'm almost positive that was true. I, don't, I I I that was a consistent thing every time I did it. Uh, we'll know that you're browsing what you're browsing. Yeah. But the VPN provider does know what you're browsing. That's fine. If you're okay with that, that's always, uh, the disadvantage. Um, if you're a streamer though, you know, just know that. So if you use Pico CTF and you log in from the command line shell, uh, your IP is visible to all 41,000 people on that system. Uh, so just know that, um, if you're going to do that, you might want to use the web browser because that IP is not, uh, your personal IP. It's an IP of, of whatever it is they use to connect their web browser to it. So uh, that's been a lot of information. I'm going to wrap it up here at two. And um, a lot of stuff. I, did, I already talked about Linux from scratch if you want to build your own. Uh, so let's let's just talk about what we talked about and give it back a recap again. Um, so well, there are many ways to get Linux. Uh, and, and, and each of these uh, is a, is a, will be faster depending on your needs. Uh, you can get you can buy a computer that's got Linux on it, uh, namely a Raspberry Pi, which I recommend everybody should get no matter what because they're just so much fun. Uh, and you know you can play with those immediately. You don't have to worry about breaking anything or anyone. Um, and you can get you can get the board itself for thirty bucks. But if you get something like the Canna Kit, um, uh, which is what I bought a lot here, you get it costs you about eighty bucks for a case and a heat sink and a power supply and blah blah blah. Raspberry Pi, so. Uh, probably the easiest. Uh, if you want to actually get a full-blown computer that has Linux, you can buy one from System76, Purism, Lenovo, or Adele. Uh, if you want to replace uh, the hardware on a new or an old operating system, uh, you can download uh, a Linux distro, put it on a USB stick by flashing it using Belenna Etcher, uh, boot from that USB stick so it, your computer thinks that's the hard drive and not the one in your computer, and then install. Click on install and install onto the hardware. It'll kick it all off and override it. Uh, and then it, you can also attempt to dual boot, even though we recommend against this, where you kind of scooch your, your operating system over a bit and make room for Linux and put it next to the other thing. Uh, or you add another hard drive to your computer and put the, the Linux on that one, and then when you boot, you can just pick which one do you want. Uh, live hosting, local hosting, 
uh, means that you're running Linux or any operating system inside of another host operating system. And the virtual machines that are most popular right now for Windows is WSL2, which comes with it. So now you know what to search for. How do I get it? Um, next, you have VirtualBox. Um, then we have VMware, uh, uh, which is a much more expensive but uh, more robust um, uh, offering. Uh, and then uh, you can try containers with Docker, although they don't play well with Windows. Uh, that's not something I would recommend to most beginners, but it is something you can definitely try uh, if you just want to use something from the command line. Uh, remotely, remote hosting. Uh, uh, so uh, let me go back. So my recommendation for locally hosting your own virtual machine, and if you're on Windows machine, is to use WSL2, hands down, my biggest recommendation. Uh, if you have a Mac, I recommend you do VirtualBox with Pop! OS, Linux Mint, uh, Endeavor OS, and if you insist, Manjaro. Um, those are the ones I suggest you download and try. Uh, and, and if you don't want to do any of that and you don't want to mess with anything and just pay to have a terminal someplace else, uh, you can use PicoCTF as long as you're playing the game. Uh, and you can go to picoctf.com or org or whatever it is. Uh, you can fire up, you saw me, you fire up a DigitalOcean system in like 60 seconds. Uh, uh, Linode, Amazon, Azure, or Google, these are all things. Amazon's not too bad either. Um, if you do any of the remotely hosted system options, just remember you're signing up for all that is included with managing your security for a highly, highly public system. In fact, DigitalOcean is well known to be scanned by their IP range, the IP of numbers, uh, by China and others to, to hack it. So if you do that, be ready to protect it. And you might not be ready if you're a beginner. So I don't re recommend re re remote hosting. In fact, if you're an absolute beginner and you're totally terrified and don't want to do, the easiest thing to do is just buy a Raspberry Pi and play with it. I mean, that's that's the easiest thing. Nobody in your household is affected by it. You know, you can. it's just total bliss. You can do whatever you want to. You can even drop it in the trash no one's going to care right um the next pot the next easiest thing for you to do is to locally host with uh, VirtualBox or wsl2 and put those things on your computer and try them all out and then when you're ready uh then what you can do is you can put it um you can actually replace your hardware and go get an old computer or a new one for 200 bucks at walmart or whatever and and put uh, linux on that and then use that going forward so hopefully this is giving you a roadmap. Um, I realize you've been staring at text and me talking the whole time, um, but that's what this is. Uh, this is pure knowledge, um, and I expect you to go out and you know do the research additionally, watch more YouTube videos from other people, uh, make decisions based on your own, uh, weigh you know your your best distro. Uh, I will do another video on what distro I think are the best. In fact, I'm going to make that video probably today or tomorrow. Uh, because I feel like I need to combat some of the uh, counter advice to what I would advise. I'll just close by saying I think Manjaro is the single worst operating system a beginner could pick. Uh, and it's very commonly recommended as the best first operating system. And I strongly and vehemently disagree with that for lots of objective reasons. Um, and so I'm just going to say that as kind of a, a leader into my the next video you're going to get from me. Um, pick pick anything but that. <laughs> pick Mint. Pick a Debian-based system because that's what you're mostly because that's what you're most likely to encounter in the wild uh, and or for any paid job. You're not going to encounter Arch uh, uh, in, for any kind of Linux certification uh, or anything you might do. Um, you know to actually use Linux to make money. Uh, Arch is not uh, a host operating system for any server ever. Uh, which is why I don't recommend it. I think you should you should pick uh, a distro that's more likely to be the same sort of thing uh, that you would use to host a server in the cloud. As you saw, uh, Arch was not an option. Uh, a lot of people recommend Manjaro for their own personal first uh, desktop distribution. My problem is, is that not a single person who recommends Manjaro can back up that recommendation with facts. And, and I'm going to challenge all y'all on that. So... Um, uh, don't use Arch as a stream server for Twitch, as Kristen. Yeah, yeah. So that's what, what I'm trying to say, guys. Okay. So you have to pick your right distro. The distro war, which this is quickly devolving into, is another conversation. But this is mostly for beginners. So I'm going to warn you, beginners, right now. If you want the least problems, pick WSL on Windows or pick um, uh, pick Pop OS or Linux Mint or possibly Endeavor OS. Uh, as a beginner, 
as a beginner. And then if you don't like that, you can put Arch on there. In fact, if you want to put Arch, look, if you want to put Arch or Manjaro or, or Arch Vanilla even on a, on a virtual box machine, awesome. Guess what? You can have both of them on there at the same time. You can try it out and see why you like it and why you don't like this and why you don't like this. Uh, so, and so let's do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I, I absolutely hate Manjaro. <laughs> So Chris gives me a hard time about that all the time and that's fine. Uh, you know, actually it's funny because Chris's video, uh, Chris's awesome video about Manjaro. He, it's such, it's, I think it's one of his best videos. I haven't seen a lot of them, but he actually says it finally happened. <laughs> See, most of the, most of the Manjaro users out there are, are people that come from the Linux background. Uh, they're not beginners. Uh, and most of the Manjaro beginners who had problems don't dare to tell anybody they had problems. <laughs> and I've, I work with beginners. So I've seen a lot of beginners who have problems with Manjaro, like major problems, like bricking their computer problems because they clicked on the graphic to upgrade their computer. I had no less than 10 people brick their machines doing that. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm look, you know, that's, you know, I, anyway, time for me to finish this video obviously because i'm i'm declining into <laughs> random banter uh so it's been great for it to have you guys um i am going to sign off for a bit uh, uh i'm actually i'm probably going to still be on the stream uh for another couple hours uh, i may even do the i may even do the the distro uh conversation next um and again my stuff is not going to be really pretty it's going to be mostly me talking and writing um but if you want to stick around for that uh, I'll do that next. I'm going to go ahead and put a mark in this one. Take care. See everybody.